All right, really good uh, to see everybody tonight. Appreciate. Um, I know I say this with some redundancy, but I really appreciate everybody continuing to be willing to try and being flexible in this. And Beverly and I were, were talking at the beginning of the middle school class tonight how, how thankful we are. Um, obviously, we would rather be in person, but um, how what a blessing this Zoom application has been for us as a church to be able to to get together and study together, even in this format, and to be able to see each other's faces and and talk with one another and share with one another. Um, I'm very thankful for it, and um, I, I know that you all are as well. Uh, Sister Kim, um, right before we started this, for those who will be watching this later, um, she gave us an update on, on Sister Ellie Geyser, um, and, and we certainly just need to continue praying for that family. Pray for Brandon, pray for the girls, and certainly pray for Ellie. Um, she's got a long way to go, and one can only imagine um, a, a good godly mother as she is being away from her girls. I was so thankful to see that picture of her being able to spend a few minutes with them outside the hospital, but um, you can only imagine um, what that family is going through, and um, they need us right now, and um, we certainly need to continue praying for them, and as needs arise, um, we'll do our very best um, to let everybody know um, if there's anything else we can do um, on top of the prayers that I know that, that we're diligently offering on their behalf. As I've said, carve some time out in your day and just give, um, give God, um, give, give this to God. And we know that God's going to bless them with everything that they need. Um, but it's so good to see you tonight. Uh, tonight, Brother Terry Mauer is going to be leading us in our singing. Uh, number 785 is going to be our first song uh, in just a moment. At the end of our service, um, Brother Ray Bronger, one of our deacons, is going to lead us in, in our closing prayer. But before um, we get into our, our singing and to our message tonight, as has been our custom over the last several weeks, I want to return back to the 119th Psalm tonight as we begin. And I want to begin reading at stanza 153, please. Psalm 119, let's begin our reading at stanza 153. The psalmist says, look upon my affliction and rescue me, for I do not forget your law. Plead my cause and redeem me. Revive me according to your word. Salvation is far from the wicked, for they do not seek your statutes. Great are your mercies, O Lord. Revive me according to your ordinances. Many are my persecutors and my adversaries, you do not, yet I do not turn aside from your testimonies. I behold the treacherous and loathe them because they do not keep your word. Consider how I love your precepts. Revive me, O Lord, according to your loving kindness. The sum of your word is true, and every one of your righteous ordinances is everlasting. Would you pray with me, please, and then we'll be led in our first song. Our Father in heaven, Father, we, we come to you this evening, a group of your people, Father, most thankful for all the many ways that that you have blessed us with. Father, we are overwhelmed by your grace and your mercy. Father, your mercies, they, they are new every morning. And Father, we are most thankful. Father, we are a sinful people, as you know. And so often, Father, we have transgressed your law. But even in the face of that, you sent your son to die on the cross for our sins, Father. And Father, we are ever indebted to you. Father, we're mindful of brothers and sisters in Christ across this nation, across this world who are suffering, some of whom have been touched by this virus. Father, we pray that you would be with them. Father, we pray for your church universally, Father, that as this is a trying time for many local works, Father, we pray that you would be with them. Father, we pray that in the midst of this pandemic that your people would be united as we cling to you, as we cling to one another, and as we engross ourselves in your word, Father. May this be a time of strength, a time of growing closer to you, a time of growing closer to one another. Father, for the church that meets at Kenwood, for the way that you have blessed us, Father, thank you. We pray for your continued care, your continued provisions, your continued blessings. Father, we would ask that you would be with the Geyser family, Father. Be with our sister Ellie. You know their needs. And Father, we know you care, and we know you hear us. And Father, for prayers that have already, already been answered on their behalf, we're most thankful. And Father, in all things, your will be done. 
We're mindful of the Pfeiffer family. Bless them, Father. Father, be with us in our time together tonight. May the things that are said, may they be in accordance with your word, and may they fall on good and honest hearts. And Father, at the end of our service tonight, it is our prayer that every single one of us will be better prepared for what lies ahead of us, that great home in heaven that you've prepared for us, Father. Thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. First song will be number 785. 785, Seeking the Lost. 785. Seeking the lost, yes, kindly entreating, wanderers on the mountain astray. Come unto me, his message repeating, words of the master speaking today. Going afar upon the mountain, bringing the wander back again. Into the fold of my Redeemer, Jesus, the Lamb for sinners slain. Seeking the lost and pointing to Jesus, souls that are weak and hearts that are sore, leading them forth in ways of salvation, showing the path to life evermore. Going afar upon the mountain, bringing the wonder back again into the fold of my Redeemer, Jesus, the Lamb for sinners slain. That's what I go on missions of mercy. Following Christ from day unto day, cheering the faint and raising the fallen, pointing the lost to Jesus the way. Going afar upon the mountain, bringing the wonder back again. Into the fold of my Redeemer. Jesus, the Lamb, for sinners slain. Next song will be 606. Yield not to temptation, number 606. <coughs> Yield not to temptation, for yielding is sin. Each victory will help you, some other to win. Fight manfully onward, our passions subdue. Look ever to Jesus, he will carry you through. Ask the Savior to help you, comfort, strengthen, and keep you. He is willing to aid you. He will carry you through. Shun evil companions, bad language disdain. God's name hold in reverence, nor take it in vain. Be thoughtful and earnest, kind-hearted and true. Look ever to Jesus, he will carry you through. Ask the Savior to help you, comfort, strengthen, and keep you. He is willing to aid you, he will carry you through. To him that overcometh, God giveth a crown. Through faith we will conquer, though often cast down. He who is our Savior, our strength will renew. Look ever to Jesus, he will carry you through. Ask the Savior to help you, comfort, strengthen, and keep you. He is willing to aid you. 
He will carry you through. Song of Invitation will be 829, Prepare to Meet Thy God, number 829. If you still have your Bibles open, I would encourage you to turn with me to Matthew, the 24th chapter tonight. Matthew, uh, chapter 24. You know, on the Mount of Olives in, in this chapter, Jesus would tell his disciples of the impending destruction that was coming um, on the great city of Jerusalem. And as a result of this, the disciples are going to ask a, a couple of different questions. In Matthew chapter 24, beginning at verse 1, the Bible says that Jesus came out from the temple and was going away when his disciples came up and up to point out the temple buildings to him. And he said to them, do you not see all of these things? Truly I say to you, not one stone here will be left upon another, which will not be torn down. We're not going to take the time to read it tonight, but there in Matthew chapter 24, Jesus is going to spend the rest of this chapter. and He's going to describe the signs and the events and the attitudes that um, would proceed and accompany this event. And, and he would relate to them some very practical things that, that they would need to do in, in light of the signs of this event that would come. And we know in, in AD 70, the Romans would, would lay siege on to this city with destruction that the world had, had possibly never seen, just as, as Jesus said would take place. And many, it seems, though, unfortunately, would ignore the warnings of Jesus. But Jesus would answer also another question in regards not only to the destruction of Jerusalem, but to the end of days when when he would ultimately return to this earth with, with judgment to follow. And he would describe the uncertainty that, that would accompany this return. And, and he would implore them, as Jesus did often, be prepared. You have got to be ready. I want you to drop down there in Matthew chapter 24. I want you to drop down to the latter part of the chapter, beginning in verse 42. I want us to listen to the words of Jesus. Jesus says, therefore, be on the alert, for you do not know which day your Lord is coming. But be sure of this, that if the head of the house had known at what time of the night the thief was coming, he would have been on the alert and not have allowed his house to be broken into. For this reason, you also must be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour when you do not think he will. Who then is the faithful and sensible slave whom his master put in charge of his household? To give them their food at the proper time, blessed is that slave whom his master finds so doing when he comes. Truly I say to you that he will put him in charge of all his possessions. But if that evil slave says in his heart, my master's not coming for a long time, and begins to beat his fellow slaves and eat and, and drink with drunkards, the master of that slave will come on a day when he does not expect him, and in an hour which he does not know him will cut him in pieces and assign him a place with the hypocrites. In that place, Jesus says, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. The message is clear. Brethren, we have no idea when our Lord will return. And Peter, as he would describe in 2 Peter chapter 3, um, he's right. Scoffers. People mock this idea of the return of Christ as ridiculous. And those in the religious world have um, literally made fantasy out of this. But Peter in 2 Peter chapter 3, he reminds us that God, well, he doesn't view time the way that we view time. And, and Jesus and the apostles who are led by the Holy Spirit, they say all of this to implore us ultimately. In light of this return, uncertain of when it will be, we must be prepared, brethren. We must be ready. And we must stay prepared. And we must stay ready, not constantly gazing in the sky, not quitting our jobs and, and waiting around, but instead preparing, growing in the Lord through the study and application of his word, preparing ourselves for eternity. Jesus said, be on the alert. You know, Jesus, he understood what we all know to be true. We as adults living in this physical existence, we have a tendency, brethren, or I can just speak for myself to be careless, to put things off, to get preoccupied with the things that, that Peter describes in 2 Peter chapter 3 as, as those things that are ultimately going to be burned up. They're going to be destroyed. And throughout Scripture, we are reminded to stay on the alert, to stay ready. But isn't it true? And this is so sad. So many will not be prepared for the day of judgment. 
so many will be surprised when the Lord comes. You know, Jesus back in Matthew chapter 24, we won't take the time to read it, but about it at verse 36, he, he, he goes back to the days of Noah and the great flood. And he, he talks about how those people weren't prepared and they ignored the warnings uh, of God uh, through Noah. And as a result, they were destroyed, right? They were doing all the things that, 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 that we do. They were eating and drinking. They were marrying and giving, and giving in marriage. And, but they were distracted, and they didn't heed the warnings of Noah. Brethren, here's my, my question for us. And I have tried my very best with, especially during this time, to, to make these messages, um, to look at things that are so practical and so relevant to us right now. Here's my question. Brethren, are we ready? Are we preparing on a daily basis? Are we distracted? Brethren, where are our minds? You know, I know you feel the same way. It literally hurts my stomach to think that so many, they're not preparing. And when that great day comes, what a terrible thing that will be for the unprepared. Rather than there is no excuse for us, the people of God, who have been taught the truth, who know what Jesus has done for us, who understand the promises of his return. There is no excuse for us not to be prepared. You know, Jesus would go on in Matthew chapter 25 to teach us a parable about preparation. And it's one that speaks loudly um, to me. I wanna read the first 13 verses of Matthew chapter 25, and I wanna make four observations, and then I, I'm gonna give it to you. Matthew chapter 25, let's begin reading at verse one. Jesus says, then the kingdom of heaven will be comparable to 10 virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were prudent. For when the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them, but the prudent took oil and flask along with their lamps. And while the bridegroom was delaying, they all got drowsy and began to sleep. But at midnight, there was a shout, Behold, the bridegroom, come out to meet him. And all those virgins rose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said to the prudent, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the prudent answered, No, there will not be enough for us and you too. Go instead to the dealers and buy some for yourselves. And while they were going away to make the purchase, the bridegroom came. And those who were ready went in with him to the wedding feast, and the door was shut. Later, the other virgins also came, saying, Lord, Lord, open up for us. But he answered, Truly I say to you, I don't know you. Verse 13, the takeaway. Be on the alert then, for you do not know the day nor the hour. Observation number one. You know, all 10 of these virgins, it looks to me, they all believed that the groom was coming. They believed that. To state the obvious in this parable, the bridegroom is our Lord. And the 10 virgins here, they represent his followers, believers. You know, a wedding in that time, like today, it was a joyous, it was a, it was a festive occasion. And, and wedding would customarily in that day take place at night. And there would be this lighted procession that would accompany the bridegroom as he would go to meet his bride to be married. And in this parable, there's no mention of the bride as that's not the emphasis of the teaching. Instead, the focus is on the bridegroom Jesus and the 10 virgins, that being us, the believers. I want you to go back to verse one. It says, then the kingdom of heaven will be comparable to 10 virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Here's what's interesting about this. You know, from the outside looking in, all of these virgins at this point in the parable, they all look the same. They have a common appearance. I would even suggest to you they have a common belief. It's evident here. These virgins believe that, that the groom was coming. They are there. They're waiting for the groom. They've brought their lamps or, or their torches. They, it's obvious. They believe that he is coming. You know, I think a lot of people believe that Jesus is coming. Um, I think there's a lot of misguided views by way of his coming, obviously. But they believe he's coming. I also believe that more than likely, every single person involved in this Zoom meeting tonight strongly believe 
that our Lord is going to return, that he's coming back. And he is. The Bible tells us that he is. Uh, very quickly, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, for, for just a moment. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, look with me beginning at verse 13. The apostle Paul would say by way of comfort to those who had lost loved ones. He says, but we do not want you to be uninformed, brethren. This is 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13. We don't want you to be uninformed, brethren, about those who are asleep, so that you will not grieve as do the rest who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself, listen to this, will descend from heaven with a shout, and with the voice of an archangel, with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then those who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we shall always be with the Lord. Verse 18. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. You know, for the faithful child of God, these should be words of comfort. Here's a test for us. When you read passages like 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, are you comforted by these words? If not, that's probably an indication that you're not ready. All of these virgins, they believed that the groom was coming. Now, let me give you another observation. Observation number two. Jesus identifies some of these as wise or prudent and others as foolish. And when you go back to verse 1 in Matthew chapter 20, 25, look at verse 1. It says, Then the kingdom of heaven will be comparable to ten virgins who took their lamps, went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them, verse 2, it says, were foolish, and five were prudent. For when the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them. But the prudent took oil and flask along with their lamps. Now, while the bridegroom was delaying, they all got drowsy and began to sleep. I want you to first appreciate the similarities in these ten virgins. They all took their lamps. There's a level of preparation, you might say. They went out to meet the bridegroom. They took the necessary first steps to be part of this great celebration. But as the bridegroom is delayed, for whatever reason, they went to sleep. Now, now notice there's no condemnation here by way of their sleeping. It appears no level of angst on, on their behalf at all, right? But here's the difference. Because Jesus here describes five as being foolish and five as being wise or prudent, depending on your version. Why were they foolish? Well, regardless of how they appeared or how secure they felt, at the end of the day, five of them were prepared and five of them were not fully prepared. Look at verse three again. But when the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them. The prudent did bring the oil. The prepared did. But the foolish did not. They weren't fully prepared. You know, Jesus during his earthly ministry, he would equate foolishness, to a lack of preparation. If you have your Bibles open, go over to Luke's gospel for just a moment. I want to look there at a familiar passage in Luke chapter 12, and I want to begin reading at verse 16 because Jesus identifies a, a fool, but it's not one that the world would recognize as a fool necessarily. Maybe not even some that believers would recognize as a fool. In Luke chapter 12 and verse 16, it says, and he told them a parable saying, the land of a rich man was very productive. And he began reasoning to himself saying, what shall I do since I have no place to store my crops? He said, this is what I'll do. I'll tear down my barn, build larger ones. And, and there I'll store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, you have many goods laid up from many years to come. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, listen to God, you fool. This very night your soul is required of you, and now who will own what you have prepared? So the man who stores up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. Jesus says, this man was a fool. Jesus says, in essence, you've prepared in some ways. You've been very successful. When it comes to earthly things, you've been prudent. You've been wise in relation to these things. You know, the people in the world, they look at this guy and say, American dream right there. I want to be like this guy. But Jesus says, no. You're nothing more than a fool. What's missing with this guy's mindset? What's missing with his words? There's no mention of God. No mention of an eternal plan. No preparation for eternity. It's all physical. And Jesus says, here's why you're a fool. Your legacy is physical. 
And the problem with a physical legacy is it's temporary. God says to him in verse 20, you fool. The fool is the man who stores up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. This man was foolish because there was no eternal preparation. Observation number three. Those who failed to prepare, they were held responsible. Back in our text in verse six, it says, but at midnight there was a shout. And behold, the bridegroom came out to meet him. Then all those virgins rose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said to the prudent, give us some of your oil for our lamps are going out. But the prudent answered, no, there will not be enough for us and you too. Go instead to the dealers and buy some for yourselves. The prudent couldn't give them oil. Here's the lesson. They couldn't give them oil even if they wanted to. Jesus says there wouldn't be enough. Brethren, it's so important that we, that we get this. No one can make spiritual preparation for another. Do we get this? There is no doubt that we have responsibilities one to another. And we often talk in regards to these responsibilities, these responsibilities that are, that are centered in love. But here's the reality, brethren. On the day of judgment, I'm going to give an account of me, and you're going to give an account of you. Period. No one can make spiritual preparation for another. And that doesn't mean we don't help. It doesn't mean we don't get involved. But at the end of the day, I have to decide to prepare. I have to decide to grow. It's on me. I'm responsible. Now, you know in our world, personal responsibility, eh? we don't hear a lot about that. These virgins, these five foolish virgins, they were responsible. In Philippians chapter 2, at verse 12, the apostle Paul would say, So then, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Brethren, in that verse, there's personal responsibility all over it. I have to work out my salvation. You have to work out your salvation. I have the responsibility to grow. Too often we look for people to blame. It's the elders' fault. Listen, these elders are going to give an account of how they've shepherded this flock, but you're going to give an account whether or not you've chosen to prepare, whether or not we've chosen to grow. Paul says you personally work out your salvation and you do it with fear and trembling. Brethren, let's prepare. Let's take responsibility for our own souls. And then observation number four, last one. Brethren, there is coming a time when our opportunity to prepare, it will close. One more time back in the text. Let's begin at verse 10. And now they were going to make the purchase. The bridegroom came, and those who were ready went in with him to the wedding feast, and the door was shut. And later the other virgins came saying, Lord, Lord, open up for us. But he answered, truly I say to you, I do not know you. The opportunity for preparation was closed. The Lord says, I don't know you. Brethren, I, I can't, I can't fathom that regret what that's going to be like, a regret for all eternity, knowing that I could have prepared, but instead I spent all of my time distracted by, well, now I realize things that didn't matter whatsoever. Jesus says the door, that it was shut. Are you prepared? You see, this world is going to be destroyed, and the things that matter now will not matter. You will spend eternity in perfection, or you will spend eternity in torment. Brethren and friends, what would it be? If you're not a Christian, you're not prepared. In Ephesians chapter 1 at verse 7, we're told that all spiritual blessings are found in Christ Jesus. Ephesians chapter 1 at verse 7 says, In him we have redemption through his blood, 
the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace. The Bible is clear. One must be in Christ to experience these great blessings. Those outside of Christ, they will not be with him for all eternity. The door will shut, and Jesus will say, I don't know you. Galatians 3 at verse 26 to Christians, Paul would say, for you all are sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. Verse 27, for as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. You see, you must be immersed in water for the forgiveness of your sins. You put Christ on in baptism, in Christ where all spiritual blessings are found. But brethren and friends, that's just the beginning. And unfortunately, as this parable points out, there's going to be those on the day of judgment who took this step, but they failed to make preparation by way of their soul for the return of our Lord and then the judgment. Listen, only you can answer this question, but I ask it again. Are you ready? I beg of you, change if you need to change. If your priorities are out of place, change them. Put Christ first. Put his kingdom first. Put your soul and eternity before the things and the cares of this world. Where will you spend eternity? Thank you for listening tonight. I, I hope that this brought to your mind some remembrance and hopefully caused you to think a little bit. And um, again, just appreciate the way that you've listened. Brother Terry, if you would, lead us in one more song, brother. 829, prepare to meet thy God. 829. Careless soul, why will you linger wandering from the fold of God? Hear you not the invitation, or oh, prepare to meet thy God. Careless soul, oh, heed the warning, for your life will soon be gone. Oh, how sad to face the judgment, unprepared to meet thy God. Why so thoughtless are you standing while the fleeting years go by? And your life is spent in folly. Oh, prepare to meet thy God. Careless soul, oh, heed the warning. For your life will soon be gone. Oh, how sad to face the judgment. Unprepared to meet thy God. If you spurn the invitation till the Spirit shall depart, then you'll see your sad condition. Unprepared to meet thy God. Careless soul. Heed the warning, for your life will soon be gone. Oh, how sad to face the judgment, unprepared to meet thy God. I really appreciate it uh, again, everybody, uh, being a part of this uh, tonight. We've got a good number on here uh, for Wednesday night and really appreciate again you joining with us. Appreciate Terry leading our, our singing. Um, just so appreciative of everyone. Brethren, let's be mindful of, of all of our shut-ins. This is certainly a difficult time for them. Let's be mindful of our sister Mary and Fentress. Um, be mindful of sister Louise Stevenson. Um, the Weedman family continue to, to pray for Betty and uh, Betty's mother and her aunt. Um, let's continue to keep Brother Howard in our prayers as, as, as he continues to struggle with his back. Um, let's uh, be mindful and prayerful in regards to the Pfeiffer family. Um, just such a, um, just a hard time for, for Mark and Rhonda and Rachel as they're just, they just wait. And certainly we, we pray that our sister Betty would be comfortable in her last days. And um, again, um, be mindful of, of the Geyser family, especially Ellie, um, during this time.
um, pray for our elders, pray for their families, um, let them know how much you appreciate them, how much we're thankful for them. Um, let's continue to pray for provisions that allow us to, to continue to worship together, every single person in a safe way. Um, let's pray for our brethren. Um, a lot of brethren right now, a lot of churches are, are struggling right now um, with everything going on. Let, let, let's pray um, for all the churches uh, worldwide, all the Christians. Um, tomorrow, our daily Bible reading is going to take place in Luke chapter 9. We've been there all week. We're going to finish Luke chapter 9 up tomorrow. Um, just five or six verses tomorrow, verses 57 through the end of the chapter. There's going to be a video uh, to accompany that reading as always. Um, so if you've not been a part of that, jump in tomorrow. Um, th that's okay. Um, I, I know that so many of us have gotten so much out of our reading this year, and it's kind of been um, something to kind of even bring us together. Um, so be a part of that if you have opportunity. And I'll just remind you that we're going to be worshiping together this coming Lord's Day in the back parking lot um, at 930. Um, the weather at this point looks like it's going to be absolutely gorgeous. Um, invite others to join us. Um, that afternoon, we're going to have our second class looking at the seven churches uh, of Asia. It'll be about 20 minutes or so. That can be found on our Facebook page along with our YouTube link found at our website. I would encourage you to participate in, in that class. Um, we say the more things uh, change, the more they stay the same. And certainly in these letters, we, we can see and, and really it's not hard to make application by way of, of where we are uh, today. Um, participate in all of these things. Let's fill our minds with the word of God this week. That's how we prepare. Um, so now, um, with all that being said, again, great to see you. Look forward to seeing you on Sunday. Brother Ray, if you would unmute yourself and lead us in our closing prayer, please. Let us pray. Almighty God, we come to you at the close of this service, thanking you for all that you've done for us throughout this day. Father, we thank you for the ability that we've been given to gather together amongst this group of like-minded Christians and others, then study another portion of your word, sing and pray and get to see each other and get to take part in this Bible study and, and, and listen to Brother Justin and study and learn. Father, may we take from this lesson that we are accountable for ourselves and only we can save ourselves on this earth with your help, but we can also help each other and let us take from that and, and, and go on and help each other and let us always be prepared because we have been shown many examples just over the past few months of we never know when our time is up or when time is called and it's that disastrous thing will hit and we need you. Father, be with those who were mentioned sick. Be with the shut-ins that were mentioned. Be with, we especially ask at this time that you be with the Pfeiffer family, be with Sister Betty as she is in the latter days of her life. We ask that you give her comfort and take her comfortably we ask that you continue to be with mark and Rhonda and rachel and and ease their minds and let them know that she she's comforted and and she's soon to be with you father we pray at this time that you be with sister ellie as she is in the hospital and she is undergoing these treatments and she's without her girls and she's so used to being with them and it's, it's troubles through the, through the medicine and the exhaustion of the, the treatments and then the not being able to be with her children and her husband in extended periods that be with her both mentally and physically that you continue to help her and, and get her through this. As she said today to Sister Kim that you're not going to put more on her than she can handle and we understand that and we need to understand that as a whole. Father, we continue to ask that you be with us as members of this church that we continue to look forward to moments like this and we look forward to being around each other if it's only for a moment that we make the time to be both on this meeting and in the bible studies and sunday morning in the parking lot father those need to be cherished moments because we never know when it might go away 
Father, we continue to ask that you be with Brother Justin as he plans these things and he works and puts these together and technology sometimes fails and he gets frustrated. We ask you to give him the give him the courage to continue on. Be with Anderson tomorrow as he goes to the orthopedic doctor and, and learns about his arm that that it's something simple and can be fixed and corrected quickly and and he's he's back at it before we know it. Father, thank you for all that you do for us daily. Most importantly, we thank you for Jesus Christ who came to this earth and died for sinners like us. We ask that you be with us and forgive us of our sins. Father, one last, we ask that you continue to be with the elders, that they continue to make those tough decisions and, and, and look to your word as we can get into the fall and the winter and looking for places to worship. You be with them that Whatever decisions they make, we as a, a body of God's people follow along those decisions, no matter the outcome. Father, all these things we pray for in the name of your Son and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.